Hello, and welcome to Prairie Puff. Coming up later on the show, we'll take a tour of the historical and cultural society of Clay County. But first up, our guest is Ruth Bachmeyer. And Ruth is the Fargo Cast Public Health Director. Ruth, thanks so much for joining us Thank today. Thank you for having me. As we get started today, tell the folks a little bit about yourself and your background. Thank you. Well, I'm a North Dakota girl, born and raised 30 miles south of here. I have never really left North Dakota and have no intentions of. Um, I grew up down south, about 30 miles south by Abercrombie Gelshed area. Got my, um, went to Jamestown College for my undergraduate degree. Um, took some further, got my master's at the University of Minnesota and have been in public health for the last 22 plus years now. I knew early on that emergency room, critical care, nursing, the, the traditional nursing roles were not for me and I have always had a passion for public health. So. Um, have been in public health now for about 22 years. The last 15 of those have been here in Fargo Cast Public Health, and about the last two and a half years of those, I've been the director at Fargo Cast Public well, Health. Well, you, you, kind of, you kind of answered this question, but you know, how, how did you come to be the director? With your obviously, the, your passion got you there, but yeah. you've been the director. You said last two and a half years. About two and a half years. Um, in 20, well, 19 years, I worked most every public health program that was out there. And I think it was the vast experience that I had. When I first started at Fargo Cast Public Health, I was a district nurse. So I had a, a geographical area in Fargo. I was doing school nursing. I was doing home visitation, a little bit of everything. Moved up to a, a mid-level management position. A few years after that, I was the director of nursing for a few years. And then when our previous director left, I was appointed the director about two years ago. Okay. Well, let's start off with telling the folks out there a little bit about what is the overview. What mm -hmm. is uh, Fargo Cast Public Health and what services do you provide? Yeah. Fargo Cast Public Health is a department of the city of Fargo. So we serve us all of Fargo, but we also have a contract with Cass County to provide public health services for all of Cass County. So our constituency is really anybody who lives within the, the city of Fargo, West Fargo, all of the smaller communities and all of Cass County. Within um, the health department, we have six divisions. Our public health nursing division, which is probably one of the more visible. We do all of the school nursing within all of the schools within Cass County. We do a lot of home visitation. We have nurses visiting new moms and babes. We have nurses visiting older folks who want to stay in their home as long as possible. We have the Division of Environmental Health, which does a vast variety of environmental health services. We have our WIC Division, which is a um, nutritional program for women, infants, and children. We have our Emergency Preparedness Division, which is one of our newer divisions, um, looking at preparing for a public health emergency. After 9-11, a lot more emphasis is placed on preparedness. And in public health, we have a lot of potential public health emergencies. So we have a lot of preparedness going on. So um, let's see, what divisions am I forgetting? Our administrative division um, and our um, environmental health, health promotion and protection division, which is our clinic setting and all of our health promotion activities. Now, are, are there, how many across the state are similar to you? Do you, do every, you know? Yeah, every county is mandated to have a public health department. We, because of our large population, we have the largest health department in, in the state of North Dakota and have the most programs and varieties of, as health departments going uh, here in North Dakota. Sure. Now, flu shots have been available uh, this fall. Yep. Can you talk some about uh, the availability and then, I guess, how, uh, for what it'll go on through the winter? Yep. Flu shots have been available for several weeks now and, and continue to be available. I think the take-home message for folks is that it's never too late to get a flu shot. Oftentimes, as we're approaching winter, we're approaching Thanksgiving and Christmas, people think, oh, I did, haven't gotten it yet. It's too late to get that flu shot now. And the reality is our influenza season runs well through March. And so now is a really ideal time to get that flu shot um, so that you'll be protected if you do come in contact with influenza. Now, will swine flu uh, be given again this year, or is it uh, combined with the regular influenza yeah. shots? Um, there was a lot of, of activity with H1N1, or the swine flu, last year, and it was a separate vaccine. Um, this year, we're very fortunate that a part of the regular seasonal influenza shot is H1N1. Every year, the seasonal vaccine has three strains of influenza vaccine in it. One of those strains this year is H1N1. So luckily, we will not have to be giving everybody two shots. We're giving everyone, hopefully everyone, <laughs> one shots. 
Um, this year, the CDC's recommendation, Center for Disease Control, is that everyone over the age of six months get a flu shot. Getting an influenza shot is really your best way to protect yourself and your loved ones from, from getting influenza and getting sick from influenza. So flu shots for everyone is really what is recommended. Okay. Now, has the CDC always recommended that? Because, you know, there are differences of opinion, and yep. I'm sure there are out there, but, you know, yes. sometimes those healthy young adults. Yep, yep. What we've really seen is a progression. You know, five years ago, it was people over the age of 65, individuals with high-risk medical conditions. A few years later, they added the kids. This year now is the first year that the recommendation is across the board, everyone should get a flu shot. What we have to remember is not only am I protecting myself, but I'm protecting that infant who's too young to get a flu shot, and I'm protecting those individuals who for whatever reason can't get a flu shot. And so population protection, we can protect everybody. Okay. What about your role during uh, the flood season, especially, I guess, in the Cass County area yep. in the last couple of years? Uh, yep. It's been a, an issue. Yes. What, what role did you play yep. then? Historically, public health's role in, in floods has been environmental health concerns, mold, you know, water gets into homes, and tetanus shots. That all drastically changed in 2009. Um, Firecast Public Health was, was tasked with um, taking, making sure and ensuring that our vulnerable population in our community it was safe and secure during a flood event. And our vulnerable population included our hospitals, our nursing homes, our group homes, individuals living alone by themselves who may need additional assistance if we were having to evacuate. What that meant in 2009 is that we did make the decision and to evacuate about 3,500 individuals from our community. Um, you know, the waters were getting high. We knew that it would take longer to evacuate these institutions, these facilities, than it would for you and I to jump in our car and drive away from the waters. And so the decisions were made with, with obviously the input of the facilities and the state health department and all of our partners that it was in the best interest of our vulnerable population to evacuate them. And so we worked close with the North Dakota State Health Department to relocate individuals in hospitals and nursing homes throughout the tri-state area. Um, they stayed there some weeks, some two weeks, and eventually were able to come back when the waters receded. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I understand that uh, the WIC program is a big part of what you do. Yep. Can, well, what is WIC, yep. first thing, and what does it provide? WIC is the acronym for Women, Infants, and Children. And it's a program that provides education, nutritional education, and services to women, children, and infants. Um, the, and vouchers, actually, to obtain nutrition, nutritional food. Um, we serve about 3,000 individuals with our WIC program at this point in time. And this is an area that we've seen a slow, steady increase. And we really see it kind of as one of those soft economic factors, indi indicators. Um, even though our un unemployment rate remains low in our community, we still have a lot of families who are struggling to make ends meet. And the WIC program is a safety net for them to be able to make sure that their children are fed and that the, those infants are getting the formula they need and those pregnant women are getting the food that they need. Okay, and uh, you also do uh, home visits for new moms and babies, I, I believe, yep. understand. Can you tell yes. us about yep. that? We have actually several programs for, that provide um, home visits to, to pregnant women, to new moms, to new babies. Um, our, the program that we're the most proud of and that we really ha is showing some wonderful outcomes is our um, Nurse Family Partnership Program. It's a um, really gold standard program that matches a nurse with a, a newly pregnant woman and their relationship continues for all, almost three years throughout the woman's pregnancy and until that child reaches their second birthday. Um, it's for first time moms, so their first pregnancies and their first child. Um, seen some really great outcomes, meaning um, a reduction in, in second um, time unintended pregnancies for the moms. These moms are having better success at finishing their education. The child is doing better in preschool, improved parenting skills, just a lot of really good outcomes from a program. Very intensive, but really good for the mom and for that baby. Hmm. So how many uh, clients or patients do you serve in a year? Yeah, we currently have between 80 and 100 families 
on, yeah. on board. Um, you know, our nurses can only have X amount of patients because it's a really intensive program. So as moms have those children and those children turn two, then we're able to add additional families. Okay. Now, do you provide uh, services to those who don't have health insurance or what, what's how does that work? Yep, we do provide some. Um, you know, the um, misconception of public health is that we are only here to serve individuals who do not have insurance. Um, and that is not the case at all. All of our programs are, are available to, to anybody. We do have some um, financial guidance for some programs, but the majority are avail available to anybody. In our actual clinic setting, we do provide limited clinical services, family planning services, immunizations, to in some individuals who are uninsured, but we also see a, a lot of individuals who do have insurance. So it's a combination of both. Now, are, do you, have you seen the number of people you're serving increase or decrease over the past few years? And I assume economy going on, what, there you go. Yeah, what, yeah. what do you see? In some specific client interaction programs, such as WIC, such as our clinic, we have seen our numbers go up slightly. Um, our numbers really fluctuate more, though, because of program and funding. If we're able to get a grant and we're able to add more programmings, our numbers go up. If the grant dollars go away and we have to decrease some programs, our numbers go down. So um, it's really program and, and funding based more than um, client based. Well, then you're hitting on it. Uh, you know, then how are you funded? Yep, yep. Variety of ways. Um, we, we do receive local dollars, both through the city of Fargo, city of West Fargo, and through Cass County. We also have a significant amount of federal funding that filters through the state agencies, primarily the state health department, and then on down to us, um, our tobacco control programs, our emergency preparedness programs, our WIC dollars. Um, a lot of our, our funding is federal funding. We receive funding through the school systems for school nursing services. So we really are, are um, open to a variety of funding sources and we're always looking to to increase our funding because as we increase our grant sources and other sources, it decreases the burden on the on the city general fund and the county general fund. Now, how many employees do you have? We have about 110 employees. Um, about 60% of those are nurses. Um, and then we add our environmental health practitioners, all of our support staff, and then our, our health promotion staff. Now, do you have volunteers at all? We, we don't have volunteers that assist on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. However, during our flood emergencies and during other public health emergencies, we do um, have a database of volunteers that we are in contact with and they are able to help us out during those emergency situations. A few times here you've mentioned environmental health mm -hmm. services. Can you explain, go into more detail about that? What yep. is that? Yep. Environmental health is one of those true public health population-based programs, meaning that anybody who eats in Fargo, breathes in Fargo, <laughs> lives in Fargo, is, is impacted by our, our env environmental health services. Our environmental health practitioners keep very busy doing restaurant inspections. Um, they do swimming pool, testing the water, we test the public drinking waters. So all of those things that are happening behind the scenes to make sure that we have a healthy community, many of them are done by our environmental health staff. Okay, well, what impact uh, in the long run do you think President Obama's uh, health care uh, overhaul bill is gonna have on your mm -hmm. services mm -hmm. and your clients? Mm -hmm. Well, we're certainly hopeful that through health care reform, all individuals will have health insurance and then be able to access the health care that we need. So, you know, ultimately that's, that's the big goal, that people will be insured. Um, we are excited about the, the portion of health care reform that deals with health, pre, health promotion and disease prevention. Historically, our nation puts a lot of money into treating sick people and not a whole lot of money into making sure that people stay healthy. And so we're excited to see some funding opportunities to increase our health promotion activities, our disease promotion activities, so that we can give our community the tools and the education that they need to make healthy decisions for themselves and for their families. Okay. Uh, do you serve any other areas besides Cass County with your services? Yeah. Um, our emergency preparedness program, uh, some of our environmental health programs are regional programs. Um, mm -hmm. The state is split up into eight regions, so we have the southeast region of, of the state. So um, some regional, but primarily Cass County. Okay. 
And I understand, well, I know there was a tuberculosis scare mm -hmm. at uh, Merritt Care, now Sanford, uh, in, in Fargo. Uh, is TB still something that uh, we need to be concerned about? We do still continue to see an occasional case of TB. You know, at any given time, we'll probably have one or two active cases in the community. Um, the important, you know, thing with, with our recent Sanford case, it was a very high pro profile case because it was a physician. And mm -hmm. so it received, you know, a considerable amount of attention. What's important to remember with TB is that there's many, a, a great range of how infectious an individual, an individual is when they have tuberculosis. Um, there can be cases of, of tuberculosis that, that are very difficult to transmit from one person to another. And so um, we, we can continue to work closely with Sanford, not only Sanford, but all of our healthcare providers and the North Dakota Health Department to ensure two things. One is that the individual who's infected gets treated properly so that they get better and, and do not infect anyone else, but also to do the contact tracing and the follow-up to assure that individuals, if they were exposed, get the treatment that they need. Okay. Well, you, we talked about immunizations mm -hmm. uh, a little while ago, but I'm going to go back to it because it seems like I've, I've heard people, especially parents, talk, choosing not to immunize their children. Uh, can you talk more about uh, your opinion and your uh, research that's in, with your stance on yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Childhood immunizations is one of the um, top public health accomplishments over the last century. Um, we, we know that immunizations have saved hundreds and thousands of, of lives of children and adults. Um, we are seeing some parents in, in our community and across the nation who are choosing not to have their children immunized for one reason or another. Our role is to make sure that those parents have the education that they need to make the um, informed decision. Um, we are far removed from the days of having entire communities be stricken with measles or mumps or diphtheria. We don't remember that anymore. And sometimes when we get, you know, 50, 60 years out, we forget the importance of immunizing our children and, and having adult immunizations too. So it's just that constant education, um, protecting your children, keeping them healthy, and keeping our community healthy. Okay. Uh, then let's uh, skip uh, subjects a little bit. Can you talk mm -hmm. some about the breast uh, cancer screenings that you do for women? Yep. Um, our, our breast and cervical cancer program is called Women's Way, and it's actually very near and dear, dear to my heart because when I first started at Fargo Gas Public Health, I was the coordinator of that program. So I've seen it grow over the last 10 to 15 years. Um, Women's Way is a, a breast and cervical cancer screening program for women who are uninsured or underinsured. The target population are women 40 to 65 um, who don't have the health coverage that they need to cover that mammogram, that pap smear, and that annual breast exam. So we're able to enroll women, get them the screening that they need, and then in, if something is discovered, we're able to case manage them and help them out to make sure that they get the treatment that they need. Very quickly, uh, what do you want people to know about uh, Fargo Cast Public Health that they may not know? Yep. Um, we are not the free clinic downtown that only serves a very small minority of folks. We are public health. We serve every single person in Cass County in one way, shape, or form. Well, and finally, if people want more information, uh, where can they go? Who can they contact? Yep, they can call our, our main number, which is 241-1360. And, of course, we're on the website, um, www.healthatcityoffargo.com. Well, Ruth, we're out of time. Thank, thanks so much yep. for joining us today. Thank you. Stay tuned for more. The distinctive roof of the Yumcomp Center in Moorhead, Minnesota is just the first of many surprises that await visitors to the historical and cultural society of Clay County. This unique museum on the banks of the Red River provides a glimpse into the rich history of our region. We've got four floors of exhibits of interest to a wide range of people. We've got lots to offer everybody on every floor.
in Heritage Hall. We have historical exhibits focusing on the Red River Valley. This uh, time we have a wonderful exhibit by Flayton and Wang, who were two Norwegian photographers who immigrated at the turn of the last century and then photographed people in our region. It's a wonderful exhibit. It's the combined collections of two photographers who worked here in Clay County, each for about 50 years or more. It's a tremendous collection, 15,500 glass plate negatives uh, taken between 1879 and uh, about 1940 or 45 or so. The collection is huge, but it's got such great depth. It's great to look back and see what the communities looked like in those times. We have the Hopperstad Stav Church, which was built 11 years ago, a wonderful replica of a medieval Stav Church. Of course, up in the ship gallery, we have the very famous Yemkomps Viking ship replica. This is the Yemkomps, which is a replica of a Viking ship, and it actually sailed to Norway in 1982. After the ship came back, it came back in a freighter, and it was put in storage until this building was built. In 1986, this building was completed. The back wall hadn't been put in yet, and the roof wasn't on. The ship was brought in on a trailer, and then they built the back wall, and they dropped the roof on top, and it's been in here ever since. Right now we're standing in the Clay County Historical Society Gallery. The Historical Society has a 77 year history now and people have been donating personal items, business items, all kinds of paper records and photographs for many, many years and we have an extensive collection, over 30,000 artifacts that are of a historical nature, all focusing primarily on Clay County. The curator and the archivist have pulled these items out for a, a specific exhibit focused on this theme. The things that I'm standing with right now were donated by one of our longtime supporters, Charlotte Onstein. This is her wedding dress and it's not the typical white wedding dress. She also gave us her hope chest that her mother had had made for her. Her mother had been saving wooden spools and had the spools split in half and decorated the hope chest with the wooden spools. Charlotte also gave us some of the accompanying items from her wedding ceremony, the cake topper, the candy box, the blue scarf of her mother's with some of the rose petals from her own bouquet. She also gave us the recipe for the groom's cake that they had for their wedding. So it's an assortment of items that really tell the story of her wedding and personalize it with those, not just the wedding dress, but also items that went along with it. We don't automatically take donations. In fact, we're calling a moratorium on the wedding dresses, I think, because we have so many. What we are looking for are, what are some of the gaps in our collection that we need to fill? Right now, we're actually looking for items from the 1960s. I know when people think of history, they think pioneer or much older, but history actually is going on all around us. We are in some of our collection storage right now where we keep the bulk of our uh, artifact collection. We have over 35,000 artifacts in our collection, so we can't possibly display all of them at all at the same time. And it's actually not a good idea to keep historical artifacts out on display for our, forever because light is one of the most damaging elements. The dolls here were used in one of the earliest uh, PBS series that was broadcast, the story of Red River Land, which was written by Erling Rolfsrud. They were the people who brought the first tourists to Minnesota. He might wear a shirt, they set up dioramas and, and told the stories um, 
you know, and, and made little scenes with the dolls. On across the stream, they took the wheels off, and then... And the dolls were made by a local woman whose name is Mildred Heifert, and they were made specially for that television program. ...box, and they got across with the contents dry. So these were the carts which they used on those Pembina hunts. On the fourth floor, we have art exhibits. Starting in January, we'll have a woman's perspective, we'll have the FM Area Visual Artists exhibit, and we'll have the Red River Watercolor Society exhibit in the summer. And we also have traveling exhibits. We commit uh, every three or four months, we change traveling exhibits here. We always try to get really high quality traveling exhibits from very interesting places such as the Smithsonian, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the National Endowment for the Arts, usually focusing on culture or history of interest to a wide range of people. We've got lots to offer everybody on every floor. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. And as always, thanks for watching.